I'm a chartered quantity surveyor, work for a company called Henry Riley. I'm executive director at the company. Been there more or less since I was born, starting out my apprenticeship. But what was life growing up for you? So it was interesting. It's a mixed bag. It's certainly something that, as you allude to there, I think it's definitely shaped me in my in my career. With mental health being such a, a hot topic, and rightly so in the construction industry at the moment, two people every day yeah. taking their own lives in the construction world. It's a horrible statistic. When my wife approached me one day um, to talk about life generally, dropped into conversation quite casually that I might have ADHD. What, what specific advice would you give the younger version of you in terms of hope for the future? Be kind, head down, life will throw shit your way, and it's just dealing with it in the right way. Being in the right environment, anyone can thrive. But I think AI is gonna, you know, you either adopt or, or you fall behind. The myth I would like to bust, and I think it's something that absolutely needs to be employed more and more within the industry. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Thriving Construction with me, Darren Evans. Today's guest, we've got Dan McPherson with us. Dan, thanks for coming along. Very welcome. I'm glad to be here. No, really genuinely glad to be here. We don't get on too much opportunity to, to catch up these days, only by the telephone, usually on business-related matters. So it's nice just to have a bit of time to yeah talk about some of the personal stuff and what's going on outside of the world of work um, beforehand. So yeah, good to be here. Good. Thanks, Dan. So for those people that are watching and listening, can you just briefly outline what it is that you do and who you work for? Yeah, I'm a chartered quantity surveyor. Um, work for a company called Henry Riley. I'm executive director at the company. Been there more or less since I was born, yeah. um, starting out my apprenticeship. And so we are a, a predominantly, a, in the UK, a project management and quantity surveying firm, um, but then very much more built environment services now as well, kind of reaching far beyond uh, the, the quantity surveying and project management uh, yeah. world. So into things like dispute resolution, expert witness type of um, type of roles as well. Yeah. And you say you've been there for a long time from... Kind of yeah, so since being, career. yeah, and since being an apprentice, um, so yeah, left sixth form college when I was a fresh faced 18 year old and, um, yeah, didn't really know what I wanted to do in life. Like a lot of people don't, um, I met my now wife when I was 16 years old at, at secondary school. So, um, for that reason, predominantly, I just ruled out university full time. So yeah. I wanted to explore my options and really stumbled across, across quantity surveying, given it was in the construction industry, which out of any industry, I was probably most interested in. Okay. Did you, when did you realize that then in your life? Because that's, that's really unusual that people not just stay in the company for a significant period of time. So you've been there for yeah, more, than, more than eight years. Normally people get to about eight years and then they shift. Um, but what was it? Well, when did you discover? Actually, I think construction is probably the one for me. So it's something my wife and I have discussed before because I don't, can't quite put my finger on it. But yeah. I think it probably does link back to the fact I was uh, I spent a lot of time when I was younger um, with my granddad um, in a village close by to where where I grew up, um, and he was a carpenter by trade. Okay. So long story short, uh, went into the RAF, came out of the RAF quite quickly in the Second World War because uh, he contracted tuberculosis. Okay. Went to a local hospital uh, to Cambridge, yeah. uh, which is I live just outside of Cambridge, um, for the open air therapy to treat it. And fortunately, he got um, he got to a point where he could start to learn a skill and a trade. So he went into carpentry um, and then he did that all his life at a, a local firm called Ratty and Kett, um, working on Cambridge Colleges, yeah. Windsor Castle after the fire. Um, and so always remember vividly going into the wood workshop and the smell of um, his workshop and all the tools spread out. And he'd always take me in there when I used to go and visit. And um, I think that's probably where the spark came, uh, to be honest. Yeah, it sounds like he was really skilled then if he worked on Windsor Castle after... That had a fire. Very much so. Yeah, it's very, very impressive stuff, and yeah. all the hundreds of chisels all laid out, wow. all for its, all for its certain, certain purpose and certain job. So, would he make stuff for you and the the family then? As you know, ch I'm thinking chairs, rocking horses, those types of things. Or? I think he did, but I can't remember. remember. <laughs> and I didn't. I'm certainly haven't got any of it. Um, it was you just you know having a bit of a go on the on the power tools and the and the chisels. To be honest, um, before then heading into garden for a, a putting. My grandfather was um, was very good at woodwork and very good at steel work as well. And I remember as a child being similarly impressed. Yeah. Especially with like, I've got a drill. You know, as a young six-year-old boy or a five-year-old boy, I remember him letting me use a power drill for the first time. And it, I honestly felt like the most powerful person in the world. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's interesting actually as well is that um, what kind of probably does make it 
more likely that my granddad led to my interest, that initial spark in, in construction. Um, we actually, um, Katie and the boys, we went over to Wales um, to spread my granddad's ashes. Mm. Um, he died in the year in, in a cemetery just outside Cardiff. So I met some family there that I'd not met um, for, well, since I was nine, 10 years old. And there was um, one of my uh, relatives. She is must be about 65 now. She actually was one of the first women in Cardiff to go into teaching DT. Okay. Um, DT as in design technology? Design technology yeah. in, um, in a school. And then another, another relative on that side of the family, um, he actually was a sheet metal worker okay. as well. And they both say that yeah. they remember vividly, you know, um, I think they called him Uncle George okay. um, coming over or him visiting um, over in Cardiff. And, and and talking about construction. So I think they, it maybe had an influence on a few people in, yeah. in the family. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how we can be influenced from those early childhood interactions with family members. Absolutely. Talk to me about your, your childhood. What was life like growing up for you? What was home like? So it was interesting. It's a mixed bag. It's certainly something that, that as you allude to there, I think it's definitely shaped me in my, in my career. It's uh, teed me up to to take advantage of a number of skills I've probably learned along the way. Okay. Um, from from my mum being in and out of um, a hospital with mental health issues. Yeah. Um, kind of, you know, when she was a teenager, it was kind of quite severe, self-harming. Um, told you she'd never have kids, um, which clearly she ended up doing. Um, and she met my, met my dad relatively young. Um, but then even through their marriage and into having me and my brother, um, she was in and out of hospital quite a lot, so hence them going going back to granddad. So this sounds going a, to his a, house a lot. So with your mum, then it sounds a lot deeper than um, a kind of a, a low level anxiety when you talk about mental health issues. Um, if she was in and out of hospital, is that is that what you're saying? Yep, absolutely. So is um, she's now been diagnosed with um, schizophrenia. She was suffering manic depression in her in her darkest times yeah is this in her teenage years or is this when she in well a mix yes it's continued throughout her life um and yeah being in and around that with mental health being such a um a hot topic and rightly so in the construction industry at the moment with you know two people every day taking their own lives in the construction world it's a it's a horrible statistic and there is some really, really good work being done in the industry. But that's um, that's now though, isn't it? That that's is what's now. happening now. But obviously back when your mum was a teenager. Absolutely. That, that must have been support wasn't there. It was electroshock therapy when that was a thing. Wow. Um the original horrible kind of electroshock therapy. Um and it it was yeah, it couldn't have been nice at all. But having having had that and been in and around that in in my childhood and yeah. through my teenage years, yeah. um obviously left home relatively young at eighteen. Cause I met my wife at 16, so we kind of started renting and, and bought our own place, had a family, etc. Um, it's it's remarkable how much when you take time to to think about it, how many of those experiences has shaped who I am mm. and my management style, mm. leadership style, how I can help people, um, and have helped people in my career. Mm. And that's that's all manner of people. That's not just internally within yeah. within Henry Riley. That's having conversations more and more frequently so with lots of different people. And, and that's more recently because of, um, because of it being a hot topic. Um, talking with clients, contractors yeah. who all have their going on, mm. quite simply. So Dan, what you've touched there, I just want to go into these things in a little bit more detail because it, it feels as though you've, you've spilt out loads and loads of things here that we can just go down because... Um, like like we've already said, back in what would it have been for your mum? Like you're talking 70s. like early seventies, yeah, sixties, seventies. Yeah, the mental health was dealt with in a completely different way than what it is now. And even I remember in Bristol there was a place um, in Bristol. It's called Glenside Hospital, and that was the place. And in terms that were used back then was where you put all the psycho people, mm. and that was the the phrase that was used back then. And they were almost locked away um, and just dealt with outside of society. Yep, absolutely. I mean, I'll go, I've only heard snippets, um, you know, yeah, the term psycho, you know, there's the mental hospital. Yes. They're obviously called different things now, yes. but a similar thing. It was a full-born hospital yes. just outside Cambridge. And uh, yeah, not a nice place to be. Yeah. So I think she was sectioned once or twice as well. So it um, sounds like your mum's got a huge amount of resilience then in order to be able to 
have all of these immense struggles at that particular time in the world's history of how they dealt with um, people with those types of struggles and then get to a point where she meets somebody, um, gets married and then has children. Absolutely. Um, it's resili resilience on on both parts, for both mum and, and dad. You know, yeah. for dad to have young kids, um, holding it down a job throughout the mum's troubles. Obviously, he's got his own shit as well, like we all do. And um, yeah, he, they've both shown great, great resilience yeah. and uh, and loyalty to one another um, as well in their time. So, at what age were you um, when you when you realised and understood the things that? your mum struggled with and how not necessarily deeply understood what she struggled with but how that impacted the relationship that you have with her or the relationship that she has with your dad when did you become aware oh, last week <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. no, it, was, it was a bit more than that it was, it was a couple of years ago um you reach a, a point in in life where we've got kids um our kids are eight and five um and and it was actually during covid that probably the it, it hit home when my wife approached me one day um, to talk about, you know, life generally, yeah. um, dropped into conversation quite casually that I might have ADHD. Um, and so that, when you start um, looking into the world of ADHD, it opens up the brain. It's not just, you know, there's a stigma, I think, and a, an idea that people have about ADHD. It's a disorder. It's, you know, hyperactivity. It's distracted. Um, one of my go-to books that I always recommend is anything surrounding ADHD because it just, everyone has got their, again, everyone's got their shit, everyone's got their ways, everyone's got something that's maybe a trigger mm. to them, whether nature or nurture. Mm. And so, yeah, understanding more and more um, about about that in the last couple of years has really made me reflect actually on on the people around me, family, yeah. friends, colleagues. Right. Um it's been fascinating, really has been. So yeah, it's been the last couple of years that it's really hit home. And so this discovery of, of, of ADHD and the link between your mum and your mental health, that was that was all made over the COVID period, if I understood that right? Yep, absolutely. And how did your um, wife how did, how did your wife even kind of come to you? She came to you one day, do you know, Dan, I think you've got ADHD. Hmm. I think I have, yeah. Yep. <laughs> my my wife's work? an amazing woman. Um very, very um empathic very switched on right. to feelings and mental health and the brain um okay. and she's um she's uh, in her life experienced lots of different people um who are neurodiverse yes. and um you know her brother for example has got um asperger's syndrome her brother her brother yeah, yeah. um and so she was again similar to me um but in a in from a, a neurodiverse perspective been brought up with uh, being surrounded by um, people who are neurodiverse or, or have me mental health issues as, okay. as I have. Okay. So that just, you learn so much without realizing it. And it's just yeah. really hit home in the last few years yeah. um, with the, the pressure that I think COVID put on a lot of people. Mm. And it was simply the fact that I was sat at my desk loving, loving being able to work sort of nine, nine, 10 hours and not having to commute. Um, and making the most of of working, as sad mm. as that sounds, mm. um, but it was the fact that it was you know I was be able to entrench myself, entrench sorry myself, in in work, and um, and I suppose it was is also probably an element of just cracking on with you know, ignoring or blocking out or whatever the um, what was going on in the world, mm. but then also having that good work life balance of being you know enjoying that time with the kids and, and Katie as well. So we were locked down for so, for so long. So it seems as though then what has happened is that Katie, your wife, has identified something in you that maybe didn't stand out as much over the COVID period because life changed significantly. Yeah. And then she came and then said, okay, I, I, I've, I've recognized some things and her understanding and other life experience that she's had helped then to kind of a, attach Absolutely. I mean, Certain the, behaviors to, uh, to, to ADHD? Yeah, so she had an inkling um, from, as I say, being surrounded by neurodiverse people. Yeah. Again, you know, family, work, people generally, friends. Right, right. For her, very, very obvious that, yeah, it's likely yeah, that, 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 that I've got it. And, and one thing um, that I've decided on, we decided on, was that actually the diagnosis isn't really about me. It's not yeah. about Katie. Whilst yeah. it will help um, our relationship, it's about being able to talk, having the label yes. in inverted commas, yes. um, 
to try and help people again both yeah. in family friendship groups and in the industry where this yeah. horrific statistic of suicidal rates exists um so yeah that's that's okay. yeah all interlinked all really interesting how really the construction is. piece the mental health piece yeah. the neurodiverse piece yeah. all very very much plays a part a factually fundamental part yeah. of um of my working life so my son has adhd um or that label has been given him and we discovered this as his parents um when he was coming out of year five in school and going into year six he was consistently in inverted commas, getting into trouble, but he was known at school as, as the lovable rogue. Mm. Yeah. You know, stereotypical stuff. Sounds so familiar. I had, is that what you had at school yep. as well? Was it lovable and My rogue? youngest is um, exactly the same as well. Okay. So he, he was actually, we were pulled aside a few weeks ago um, by the teacher just to say, look, might want to get the SEND just mm. in to, to come and observe James, mm. um, our youngest kid, who is a lovable rogue. Um, <laughs> and it's it's fascinating. Again, you take it, um, where it is very, very valid and important, I think, for, for kids as young as possible to get the diagnosis. Because if you take a child with ADHD and put them in an environment where they will thrive, that kind of just subtle changes sometimes, yeah. sometimes more significant changes, yeah. they will thrive. Yeah. But in an environment that is... Is restrictive. not conducive. It's yeah. restrictive. Yeah. They will struggle Hybridism. and they will stick out like a sore thumb, yeah. Yeah. Um, which which James um, has the tendency to do. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really interesting, really fascinating at both ends of the spectrum in mm. terms of age and, and diagnosis. Mm, great. So if you now are thinking back to 15, 16 year old Dan, what, what advice would you give him or what would you say to him? Um, about how you view the world or you viewed the world back then from your experience now? I think naturally with age, you, you learn, but I was very, very set, um, in my trail of thought and my approach to life, which was kind of validated by, by my wife as well. It's kind of part of the reason we, we came together and, um, have succeeded in a, a very happy marriage. No doubt there's always times isn't there um, any marriage that you're ups and downs um but yeah we we met young we had the same ideas of of life uh, the same values and and we had the same of what we wanted out of life which mm. was ultimately to be happy mm. that should be number one mm. um to be happy and and have a great set of people around you that you can love and care for um and it's gone basically according to plan at the time there are people saying you know you've done too much too soon you know, go off to university or you're settling down young and, right, right. you know, you're making a mistake. And right. and we just ignored it. We yeah. were very um, headstrong together, yeah. very headstrong. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's obviously things you'd, you'd make tweaks on, I think, but nothing nothing spectacular or um, too major, um, which I think we're very fortunate to be in that position where we can where we can think like that. That's good. But what, what specific advice would you give the, the younger version of you in terms of hope for the future? Would you say... It's okay. It's all going to be. It's all going to be great. Or would there be, would there be a, some other piece of advice that, that you would give fifteen, sixteen year old Dan? Be kind is a big one. Right. Be kind. Um, head down. Life will throw shit your way, and it's just dealing with it in the right way. And when I say the right way, using people to talk to, use your true friends. So your network. Of, use your yeah. true family. Yeah. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, so these are the one that, those. these are the people that really have got your back, that really Absolutely. are there with you for the good things right. and for the bad things. And yep. the ones that will just show up when you're just having a really difficult day and, Absolutely. and just be with you. And 16, 18 year, year olds, that's a difficult, it's a difficult stage of life because, you know, you tend to be attracted and hang around with your friendship group that maybe you've had from primary school, secondary school. Mm. But they might not necessarily be your your guys and your girls, mm. um, you kind of find it when you probably are 18 plus. Yeah. Um, there's some people, you know, I've um, got a neighbor um, who's a, a best friend. He's known his, uh, one of his best friends since they were in primary school age. Right, right. Um, and they've retained that bond and that really Connection. great friendship. But um, yeah, just if the people haven't got your back, yeah. it's kind of bad just to ditch them sooner rather than later, <laughs> quite simply, <laughs> and having the in balls nice to do way. that. And I, I was kind of had to do that to a degree. You kind of find out who your real friends are when yeah. you're going out to hang out with your yeah. your future missus rather yeah. than um, yeah. rather than going out on the lash with with the lads. <laughs> 
And so now you, your boys aren't quite teenagers, but I'm wondering for people listening to this or watching this, they might be thinking, well, do you know, I think that my son or my daughter has ADHD or my daughter or my son has ADHD or maybe suffers with mental health um, or neurodivergent in some way, shape or form. What have you found in your experience that you can share with other people yeah. that are struggling to navigate? I mean, being a parent is hard enough as it is. Being a parent and working is is even more difficult. And being a parent in this society at the moment, and then having the complexity of neurodiversity. Nor I can't even say the word. Right, that's what neuro <laughs> neurodiversity um, is um, is is tricky enough, isn't it? So, yeah. what 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 advice or, or what pointers would uh, would you give? I think again, coming back to the headstrong point and being very assured in in the way me and my wife think is that. We, for our kids, and I think that's probably the best example to use, is that we've both said as long as they come out of the education system happy, we've succeeded. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you realize and go back to the point I said earlier about being in the, in the right environment, anyone can thrive. Yes. Is that there's so many opportunities um, in the construction industry alone, bucket loads of opportunities. Um, you know, things like my, my youngest, well, both kids, they play Minecraft. Right. They're already designing buildings <laughs> at the ages of, you know, four and five. They started that. Yeah. And so they're the head of the game from that perspective. Um, and I think patience is a big part of it. Mm. Patience, um, kindness, focus on being happy rather than being the focus on going to university, mm. which I think was certainly the, the message that the government was portraying when I was going through secondary school. It was always, right, sixth form university. That's the route you've got to go. Otherwise, you'll be a failure. Mm. Um, but actually... Um, on the flip side, again, one of those things looking back mm. is that I was completely misinformed because at the time, those um, friends that were going off to kind of polytechnic type college uh, to do plumbing, carpentry, being electrician, construction management, it was like, oh, why are they doing that? That's a bit strange. They're not going to, well, they're not going to succeed in life. And lo job. and behold, you know, they're, they're amongst the most successful and yeah. um, it, from a yeah. from a pure kind of financial perspective yeah. and the ability to earn, yeah. um, but then there are these inherent issues, which I say again, especially amongst the trades with mental health issues, mm -hmm. um, which I think going back, coming full circle to ADHD, is that you know if you are have ADHD in the wrong environment where you're not going to thrive, mm -hmm. you will stick out, you'll be disruptive, maybe mm -hmm. you won't learn as well mm -hmm. or as quickly, mm -hmm. and so you get kind of you know. You know, pushed into a corner and, and guided down a certain path, mm -hmm. which was at that time to go to um, to go to college, mm -hmm. not sixth form. Mm -hmm. um, and so, actually, with ADHD, um, the one of the stats is you're five times more likely to um, encounter suicidal thoughts. So you take that and the, the peaks and troughs with with mood Life. and yep. um, happiness and sadness. Yep. You kind of you put the two and two together. It's yep. not for me. Um, there's something in it mm. um, as to why the uh, the suicide rate is so high in the in the construction industry, mm. and which is why yeah, obviously keen to to talk about it more and more mm. um, to try and to try and help people and as much as we can. So talking about it is a big part of it. Just mm. talking mm. and being comfortable in talking about it mm. is a game changer. Mm. Those conversations I've had recently with with uh, certain clients that I'm close to um, contractors, even some subcontractors um, and consultants. It kind of every every part of the world of work um in yeah, which i operate it's, it's, in it's covered it's it? in everything yeah we're all people everything. yeah yeah where there's people there's that I, I really love the thing that you said um at the start of um your advice where you said it's about a child coming out of the educational system feeling happy and feeling um connected you mm. didn't say this but connected included and having a sense of self-worth and, yep. and belief <laughs> Because I think that you're, you're exactly right, is when going back again to the experiences that you've had with your grandfather, it sounds like you were connected with him. And so that's one of the things that helped you to learn or to understand or be interested what he was interested in, mm. is that there was that emotional connection that then led to learning, which led to joy or fun or connection. And those elements need to come together. 100%, absolutely. And again, feel very fortunate that somehow it's all come together very, very nicely. Yeah. Um, but again, going back to the, the conversation piece is there's only, uh, and, and talking about the education system as well and, mm. and 
how to try and navigate that with with children generally um, is that again just being comfortable and and semi informed about kind of neurodiversity is that is I can't remember what, how it came up but it was very simple off the cuff kind of comment we're with a um, with a client at a social a couple of weeks ago we got chatting long story short um, she's she was saying her child who's five the same age as my yeah. my youngest is constantly saying that she was stupid and i'm so stupid i'm so stupid right. james so the, is doing so the child was beating herself up saying james okay we, we're working on him now where he's, yeah. he's saying it less he's still yeah. saying it every now and again yeah. Yeah. we've worked on him just that constant reinforcement yeah. you're not stupid you're a lovely boy you're yeah. you're clever you're yeah. kind yeah. um you're intelligent yeah. you know you're such a wonderful kid yeah. and that constant reinforcement and that yeah. patience in Changes doing so um, but then that led on to you know apparently her dad was um, had adhd and okay. then um yeah it's it's incredible the yeah. conversations where yeah. where conversations can lead and that so many people are affected some knowing it and some without knowing it but i'm sure there's many many more people are affected by um by neurodiverse yes uh by neurodiversity than 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 are aware just one quick thing. Have you heard of a guy called Gabor Mate before? I haven't. Okay. You've mentioned him, I'm sure, in the past, but not come across him. So Gabor Mate is a, a psychologist who has ADHD, um, and he also has dyslexia. He has studied ADHD, um, and so his theory is that it's connected. ADHD is connected to trauma in some way, shape, or form, um, and ADHD is also passed on generational, generational, generational. So it's not a, um, a physiological or a, a biological issue, that it's a coping mechanism um, to be able to deal with something that wasn't understood correctly in the, in the past. In the past. And that can go back many generations. Exactly right. Wow. And so, so parents pass it on to children who pass it on to their children and, and so on and so on. And I think that it's really interesting for me, at least when I look at things and I um, look at things like the, the Second World War, maybe the First World War, and the trauma that these men and women had as a result of those wars then got passed on to those to their children mm. who got passed on to their children. And so I think to, to me, it, it seems as though we're unraveling things and finding out things that, that happened back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, people really suffered, it seemed, in the 70s, mm. 80s, potentially not as much in the 90s, and we're kind of starting to... To, to understand things a little bit better now. That's just my theory from yeah. listening to people like Gabor Mate and from the experiences that I've had. Yeah, fascinating. But, um, but yeah, I would, I would recommend you um, uh, listening to or, um, yeah, listening to his work. I think his work is, is fascinating. Yeah, we'll do. That sounds good. I think that's really good advice though, uh, Dan, that you've given for, for people that are out there, specifically around being kind as well. And, and also bringing it back to what you mentioned before, which is about that network. Who is it that's your family? So that could be biological family or, or <laughs> sociological mm. family, um, because it's really, really important to have that to have that network around. No, hundred uh, percent. It's you've got to have those people around you. Um, with me, especially, problem shared, problem halved. Yeah. If I haven't got the ability to talk to those close friends, yeah. um, close family members, if I'm not able to talk to Katie because I'm away for a night or two, right. Um, depending on the timing, that can be that can be really tough. So having those people around you is is so important, it, certainly for me. So how does that show up for you then in your current role? Because you, as a leader of your organisation, um, you've got the opportunity to make changes um, to have impact. Absolutely, it's a really really exciting place to be. Which is going back to an earlier question, the reason I stuck around for so long is a great organization with great people and culture. This isn't a sales pitch. This is genuinely from the heart. <laughs> um, and we're always looking to do the right thing. And if there's something we need to change, we've always got that on the horizon in terms of horizon scanning for mm. what we need to do um, and what we can implement for the good of our people, quite simply. Um, and that covers not just neurodiversity, but a number of are different things as the world of work changes um, and evolves. Mm. And so being in a company that is in tune with that and completely open to uh, discussing and reviewing anything to implement positive change um, to help our people is is what we're all about. And um, So what's gone on recently then 
that, that you can say actually this is positive change that we've done as an organization and this is maybe the impact that we hope to have is there anything that comes to mind yeah well i think so from a, again per, just personal perspective yeah. um it's the it's always have having the ability and autonomy to to go out and and talk to people so i was with a colleague um maya a few weeks ago at uk construction week where she was on stage chairing a panel discussion about the future of construction. Right. Um, she's a, a young woman in the world of quantity surveying and project management. She works with me in, in our Cambridge office. Um, and it was just incredible to see her chairing a panel um, of equally impressive women um, talking about what the future of construction looks like for, um, for her as a young woman. Um, but also for her as a quantity surveyor mm -hmm. and for the other people that also work in the construction industry. And so there was ideas that came from that panel discussion mm -hmm. that we've taken away as a business and we are exploring on, on, on implementing change just to again make sure we're supporting people properly. No one person has all the answers, mm -hmm. but what you can do is have a lot of discussions and, and be open and make it very, very clear ideas and thoughts mm. and that collaboration internally mm. and externally mm. are completely encouraged mm. to try and always ensure that you're always mm. on the front foot when it when it comes to, to positive change right. that's one of the things that i really firmly believe in is that no one person has a monopoly on good ideas or a good way forward or the best way forward and so i've got um the thing in my business where we will speak as a company we're quite small we've only got 19 people nowhere near the sizes of, of, of yourself so it's quite easy practically for us to do that um, but just to, to use it as a bit of a, a, a working group to say look we're going to go off in this direction this is what we're doing this is why we think that's the case let's talk about this and we'll we'll speak about it sometimes it will be for minutes and sometimes it'll be for longer but i think it's really important to give enough airtime for me to understand what it is that the person is trying to either convey or, mm. or say even though maybe it will come across negatively just from from the off you need to understand okay what's what's behind this what's the fear what's what's driving this what's the what's the thing to um make sure that i understand as a leader of my organization um everybody's viewpoints but within the right context because mm. i think sometimes it's easy for leaders to understand someone's viewpoint but in the wrong context it could take you off in a, in a wrong direction yeah no, absolutely i think it's it's having those forums um at all levels all ages all genders all races yes. all religions you yes. know to be able to have a safe environment to discuss yeah and understanding sometimes what those safe environments look like um you know can be can be tricky mm -hmm. um but it's trying to always do the right thing mm -hmm. I'll fall back to that um that phrase trying to do the right thing you can't really go wrong but it's important yeah things like shadow boards and um we have a, a women's leadership group okay Remy riley um how many is that the company uh so we're now up to 800 800 yeah okay, fine. um okay. and that's uh, predominantly uk um australia new zealand malaysia okay so not just a uk company across the world yep absolutely anything in the us no, not yet. Not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> maybe soon, maybe soon. So what is the thing now that you're doing within your organization that supports or positively affects uh, net zero or the move to net zero? How, how do you address the, the, the climate crisis in, in your organization? Well, so really, really um, hot topic, something I'm really um, enthusiastic no, no and passionate intended, about. No, yeah. hot topic, no? No, not, not intended at all. <laughs> um, so as part of our, our partnership, recent partnership with uh, TSA. Um, Who are we, TSA? So TSA are Australian part of our business okay. um, and the footprint company. So we've, we've gone through this um, about six months ago, um, entered into this partnership with these organizations. And we now have um, a really, really exciting, um, wider, bigger and better a group of of people whereby on the on the net zero carbon piece specifically we've just recently launched our carbon advisory services which as part of the partnership as i said earlier we've now got the footprint company who have um so carolyn dr carolyn Noller, set up that company 
um, and has been involved in in the creation of certain sustainability standards such as LEED mm -hmm. and Neighbours that mm -hmm. will be familiar to, I'm sure, many people in the industry and um, has produced a trademarked piece of software called the Footprint Calculator, mm -hmm. which is one of only two pieces of software globally that's aligned to the RICS's ICMS3 measurement standards. Mm -hmm. Um, so when part Z comes in, the anticipation is that when there's a mandatory requirement to report on carbon, um, that it will have to be aligned with ICMS3. And so we're, we're very in a very fortunate position mm -hmm. where we own the software mm -hmm. that can, can spit out, you know, what the actual, um, whole life carbon of a project is. Mm. There's, there's software out there that you know, in, in crude terms, linking it back to the world of quantity surveying, is that you don't you know measure sixty percent of a building when you're producing a cost plan. Yeah. Um, you measure <laughs> everything. You know, you measure your preliminaries, external works, <clears throat> over and profit, um, services, stats, fees, um, which all do attract embodied carbon. Yeah. There's there's carbon attached to all those things, yeah. and so. So this software accounts for everything, then it accounts for everything, saying. and we can we can feed the machine. Yeah. So we uh, we employ. Does it, does it give recommendations? So or, or does it just absolutely? It does. Yeah. Okay, it gives recommendations for um, you can you can because we own the software. Yeah, it's it's amazing because you can you can feed in um, new materials into yeah. the green book, which yeah. is the other part of um, the footprint company um, software offering. So it's a bet, effectively a. a book of materials and their associated embodied carbon which have been properly analyzed by data scientists yes. who will properly calculate the embodied carbon no matter yeah. what the epd says it might have in it yeah. there's a verification process that goes on there yeah. and it will be fed in it'll be measured so quantity surveyors ideally placed to properly measure buildings as we do when we're taking off quantities um, for cost estimating and cost planning and it comes up with yeah, all sorts of amazing and interesting um, information yes. on how to reduce. Yeah. Um, what are the key key areas that that have the highest embodied carbon level? You can go top five, top ten, um, and so we have our software engineers um, as well who can who can adapt to to suit certain requirements um, without, but whilst always being aligned to ICMS three, which is the key and fundamental piece for when Part Z comes in. Um, anticipated to be next year so i can hear people now just kind of screaming out loud is this for sale why have i not heard about it is you know i may be a little bit of envy there is is this just for henry riley this piece of software no so we're we're in the process now of effectively not having enough bodies on the ground to be able to go and shout about it um it's a, it's it's a game changer um for not just ourselves obviously from a selfish perspective and being able to go go and, and advise clients. Um, but when I say clients here, this is everyone in the industry now. Okay. So um, we're talking to architects and structural engineers, yes. contractors, subcontractors, yeah. clients, manufacturers yeah. of uh, building components such as yeah. modular manufacturers yeah. and panelized manufacturers. Yeah. Um, we're even talking to sort of quite nuanced and bespoke system manufacturers. Um, which is um, that inquiry came in just last week. They want to, they've got a couple of completed buildings with their, um, their anticipated to be low carbon mm -hmm. um, system. It, it hasn't been measured in the world ever because it is their own trademarked um, structural system. Okay. Um, and so, so they be... approached you to say, look, we've got something we think is a game changer. Can we use your software to absolutely because they they see the value in being able to say yes. we have measured yes our system yeah. using this this software that is aligned to the the proper standards and and that that alignment i think is really really important because it seems like the wild west at the moment when it comes to um embodied carbon that's the phrase i keep using to, oh, is it to the, same phrase? the wild west went it's out there absolutely yep. bonkers what do you want the computer to tell yeah, you yeah and, and we can do i use the word before you know manipulation you can manipulate this and manipulate that and i think that the way that you're describing manipulation is more to do with um understanding how to get to the best result that's accurate as opposed to how do i manipulate the system to absolutely. give me the answer that i oh, want so want. i look good absolutely and that's what we often find with other pieces of software um is that you know taking the example of a window the um alternate pieces of software will measure just the glass of the window it doesn't consider the casement right. the seals yes. the the gas yeah. 
yeah. um, the, the aluminium from China. Um, it, <laughs> it just accounts for the glass. Yeah, and so true. actually, yeah. you know, you run it through the, the software in a proper way that's aligned to the international measurement standards that the RSCS um, have produced, the embodied carbon is higher. Yeah. But when it comes to, to, um, to Letian, uh, um, is that the great thing, because we, again, we own and can manage the software, we're gonna. We're just at the moment going the pro, through the process with our software engineers to click a button, whereby you can then that Letty button will can tell you what the Letty standard, standard of measurement will tell you, right. which is lower yep. compared to what the um, the footprint calculator will tell you. So you've still got those yep. comparisons there, which are valid um, because we want to you know, push things forward. We don't want to be a barrier. Yep. Uh, we want to absolutely enable and arm and equip. Um, everyone in the industry to, to start understanding what this embodied carbon and whole life carbon is all about. That's a great bit of software. That is a great bit of really software. exciting. Yeah, it's exciting times. So, um, so who keeps the software or your company honest? <laughs> That's a question. I don't know the answer to Darren. <laughs> Darren um, I, I don't know in all honesty, because yeah. it's an internationally recognized standard because there's the lack of experience and expertise globally um, in yeah. terms of the measurement of carbon. Really. The RSCS have clearly produced um, the ICMS3 yeah. measurement standard, but in terms of the verification of if you know people are doing it properly, we are we are having discussions, and I can't say too much, mm. but we are effectively at the moment um, having discussions with with different organisations about being the auditor. So when Part Z comes in, and yeah. even before that, because we have got the expertise um, within the company that we would go in as an auditing role rather than actually doing the calculations. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, early days, um, uh, but some really exciting conversations. So that's so that's really exciting then that that is coming out. Um, uh, what's your, just out of interest, my personal interest, what's your uh, model for reselling this? Are you going directly to those clients or are you having someone that's in charge of selling this software within territories that you're then charging to go out or encouraging yep. them to go out. And you just reminded me what the point I just forgot was. So the foot, the footprint calculator, it doesn't need us to actually plug in the numbers. Okay. Part of our service is to go into organizations, contractors, for example, yes. when it's, well, it gets very complex and probably too much for a, um, for a morning conversation. But when it comes to actually contractual arrangements yeah. is that under design and build, Lots of clients will want the contractor to take on the responsibility take to yeah. to report on um, on Part Z, yes. take the responsibility for ticking the pop box of Part Z. Yeah. And so what we will do and can do, we can either do it for contractors, clients, whoever, or we can actually train customers in how to use the software. Right. Um, and there'll be a validation piece um, to do that so you know yourselves again could be trained up in the use of that software right um so that when when the time comes you know you you can go into advising clients knowing you're using um the software that's legit and in the right way and in the right way mm. absolutely and so do you know if this is, this is probably a tricky question here but do you know if ai is going to be involved in this software any way shape or form it's got to be i think in the future i think ai is gonna it, it's um you know, you either adopt or or you fall behind. I think, um, again, adopting in the right way. But I think certainly the limited amount I know about AI um, and my limited use of Chat GPT already, um, <laughs> it's it's got to form part of the future. Um, but there's a whole regulation piece. Clearly, there's a very good kind of digress now. But there's a very good presentation undertaken um, by a fire engineering and building control consultancy as part of a CBD yeah. the other day, and there was a photo, and he said. What's wrong with the photo? And it was of, of a decking outside of a house. Yes, yes. There was some railing missing. And so, you know, what's wrong with the photo? Well, they've they've actually AI'd the, the railing around the decking. Um, it's not actually physically there if you were to go and inspect that site. So it's, um, yeah, interesting and lots of considerations. But I thought that was a good yeah. analogy for where, you know, you've got a... The, the role of on-site site inspections mm -hmm. and and more traditional procurement methods, mm -hmm. I think with you know with AI, with building safety, with embodied carbon, the role of um, on-site presence and inspections of various different professionals within the industry, 
will start to play a much greater part again in in what we're seeing. Dan, I think now we're at the time where we can go and talk about myths and debunk them. On this podcast, we call it the Demolition Zone. Right, love a Demolition Zone. Are you ready? Ready. Let's do it. Okay, well, Dan, you have created a very lean and extremely tall tower here as a representation of this myth that you want to uh, destroy. Um, talk, us, talk to us about the myth. What is it? What does this represent? Well, I would like to start by crediting the tower. Yeah. As I was building it, I was thinking that this is exactly what my youngest son does in Minecraft. <laughs> he builds the tallest possible tower he can, which is 320 blocks high. Um, and then he swipes out the bottom block and just watches it tumbling down. So, yeah. He's your inspiration. As I said earlier, he's a little mini me. So uh, clearly when it comes to building blocks and demolishing them, we're exactly the same as well. <laughs> well, let's hope that you show this to him <laughs> when, uh, when this comes out. But what does this represent, Dan? Um, right, so the myth I would like to bust, and I think it's something that absolutely needs to be employed more and more within the industry, it's been pretty good while I'm while I've been in the industry, mm. but it's about communication, collaboration, and sitting around a table and discussing issues and problems, um, sometimes contractual, sometimes practical, uh, relating to delays or money or whatever it might be, and just getting in the room more with people. I think COVID has had the potential to to move away from the very very good progress i think a lot of organizations and pockets of the industry had made um, because we're all back on teams again mm. uh, for the majority of the time mm. but the value both pre-contract and post-contract in our industry of getting around the table with whoever you're working with designers subcontractors contractors clients whatever is so important mm. and communicate and talk don't bash over the head and act in an authoritarian or dictatorial way. Mm. If you want to get the best out of people, work with them, try and understand them. Yes, you've got, everyone's got their own interests to work towards and get out of a project. Um, but yeah, I'd like to just b b bust that myth, myth that bust <laughs> of, um, of, yeah, just that standoffish, death by email yeah. approach yeah. to resolving disputes and issues in within the industry. So the best way of resolving issues is coming together in person, having open conversations and connecting with people. Summed up perfectly. Wonderful. Love it. You can now destroy this myth. And I'm going to do it how my son would do it. There we go. <laughs> Loved it. That bottom brick flew out and the rest of the tower came tumbling down. And I will tidy up. <laughs> Thanks very much. Dan, it's been great having you here on the podcast. I really appreciate your time and, and coming in. It's uh, great to listen to your wisdom, your experience. That's no, very kind. Um, and yeah, it's been, it has been genuinely good to take some time out and have a discussion like this. Hopefully people will take snippets, little little gems out of the conversation. Um, yeah, look forward to, um, yeah, hopefully hearing it soon. Great, fantastic. Before, uh, before we close and we finish, I just wanted to kind of ask you one maybe tricky question. If there was one thing the piece of advice that you could give to the world that would fundamentally change people's lives, what would that be for the better? Change people's lives for the better. Only a small question, Darren. I, I said it might be a little bit tricky, but just one thing that you think would fundamentally change people's lives if they did or didn't do this one thing, what would you say? Off the top of my head, given a limited amount of time to think about it, those simple acts of kindness, they can go such a long way. And those good mornings, those genuine how are you's, trying to get a genuine response from people. I think that's an absolute game changer. Dan, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Darren. Thanks. Hi, thank you very much for watching this podcast. 
I'd like you to do me a favor, and I don't mean here just to ask you to subscribe and to follow, but what I'd really like you to do is to share this podcast with as many people as you think would benefit from it. I would love to maintain the quality of people that are joining me on this podcast. And so in order for me to do that, I really need your help. And the way that you can help is by sharing the podcast with the people that you know that you think may have a slight interest in or maybe a deep interest in the guests and topics that are covered on this podcast. It is all about construction, so that may lead your thinking towards people that are already in the construction industry. But I don't think we necessarily need to be that narrow with the people that we can reach out to. It could be somebody that's looking to get into uh, an industry, but they're not quite quite sure what industry they want to get into. Maybe it's a teenager that is just finishing their GCSEs or starting A-levels. Maybe it's somebody that's doing an English degree at university, but is not quite sure what they want to do with that degree. So I invite you just to share this podcast with as many people that you know, so that we can grow this community, so that we can maintain the quality, engaging conversations that we're having together. Thank you for your help.